Hello, everyone. Good morning, afternoon, and evening. Thank you for all for joining today's webinar, Food Loss Across Transforming Food Systems. My name is Robin Sresta, and I'm the Research and Capacity Building Manager at the Feed the Future Food Systems for Nutrition Innovation Lab at Tufts University. I will be the moderator for today's webinar. Uh, as more attendees are joining the webinar, I will begin by going over some of the Zoom logistics. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, I would like to direct all attendees uh, to a few functions on this Zoom call. At the bottom of your screen, you should see a chat icon and a Q&A icon. We encourage attendees to use the chat feature to introduce yourselves and engage in relevant conversation with other attendees. Next slide, please. If you have a question for our speakers, we ask that you submit them using the Q&A feature. Uh, we have allotted uh, 30 minutes of this webinar for Q&A. Next slide, please. Uh, I would like to now introduce our two fabulous speakers for today's webinar, uh, Jocelyn Boto and, and Prabhu Pingali, who are presenting the proposed book that examines how food system reforms can support and achieve SDG targets 12.3 by uh, reducing food loss and waste and support sustainable, safe, and nutritious food and diets in low and middle income, country, middle income countries, excuse me, at different points of structural transformation. Uh, our first speaker, Dr. Prabhu Pingali, is a professor in the Charles H. Dyson School of Applied Economics and Management at Cornell University, with a joint appointment at the Department of Global Development. He is the founding director of the Tata Cornell Institute for Agriculture and Nutrition, he is currently the chair of the board of ICRISAT, a fellow of the American Association for Advancement of Science, a member of the US National Academy of Sciences, and a fellow of the American Agricultural Economics Association. Dr. Pingali has written 14 books and over 200 refereed journal articles and book chapters. Welcome, Dr. Pingali. Dr. Jocelyn Boto is a postdoctoral associate at the Tata Cornell Institute for Agriculture and Nutrition. She earned her PhD in International Nutrition in 2021 from Cornell University. Her doctoral work focused on measuring food loss and waste along tomato value chains in South India. Jocelyn is also trained as a registered dietitian. I will now hand over to the two speakers uh, with the presentation. Dr. Pingali, do you want to go first? Thank you. Thank you, Robin, for a great introduction. Uh, it's great pleasure to be here, to be part of this webinar and be part of the Food uh, Feed the Future Nutrition Innovation Lab discussions. Um, Jocelyn and I have been working on this book on food loss across transforming food systems, which we hope will be uh, ready for publication towards the end of this year, early next year. And we appreciate this opportunity to present some of our ideas behind the book, et cetera. Uh, Jocelyn will be the main player today. And my role is to provide a broad introduction and then hand over to her. But as I start, let me uh, very quickly introduce the Tata Cornell Institute. Many of you may not know about the Institute. The Tata Cornell Institute is an independent research institute in the College of Agriculture at Cornell University. And our mission is to look at uh, improving um, food systems, making food systems more uh, nutritious, more affordable, more accessible, and to looking at the role of agriculture, agriculture productivity growth, diversity, as a means of getting to better food systems. Our focus up to now has been on food systems transformation in India, um, but we've been gradually looking beyond India. Much of our work has been looking at documenting the transformations that are taking place in food systems and transformations that are taking place because of economic growth, rising incomes, rising middle-class populations, et cetera, and looking at the nutrition transition that's been happening. And, and as we've 
looked at the issues around nutrition and nutrition transition and the role that value chains, food value chains are playing in meeting food and nutrition needs of populations, especially urban middle-class populations that are transitioning to a more um, diverse diet, especially perishable food diets. The issue of food loss comes in very clearly, the issue of food loss, food waste, that was traditionally seen as an issue at the farm level in developing countries is quickly moving along the value chain. And we're beginning to see a lot of the loss happening along the value chain. And we're beginning to see increased amount of waste at the consumer level. And so that brought us to this topic. And Jocelyn has been leading much of our effort in this area starting with her PhD thesis work and then continuing on since then. Next slide. So let me give you a couple of examples of this work now that Jocelyn's been leading. Uh, the, the work that uh, Jocelyn did for her PhD uh, was looking at uh, the perishable food value chains in India and looking at food loss and waste along them with a particular attention to the tomato value chain. And she followed the tomato value chain all the way from uh, the farm level and all across through the, the local wholesale market, um, the retail markets, et cetera, and then moving up to urban areas, the urban wholesale markets, the urban retail markets, et cetera, and, and try to measure the extent of loss and extent of based along this tomato value chain. And that work was published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition uh, last year. And it, it shows that while the quantity losses is very much at the farm level, at the post-harvest uh, level at the farm, um, as you go along the food value chain, what you begin to see is much more of intangible losses, intangible losses in terms of quality uh, degradation, nutrient loss, et cetera. And these losses have been much harder to uh, measure. The metrics around them has been much more difficult. So while much of the discussion around post-harvest losses at, at measuring quantities of loss, the bigger uh, losses that one could see are losses in, in quality, in nutrition value, et cetera. And that's where much of the, the work needs to be headed as we look at this field into the future. The second paper uh, was a paper that came out in Global Food Security. And it was kind of a result of much of the, the literature work that was done uh, in this area by Jocelyn. Um, and, and, and some of the findings that come out of this paper is, while we talk about food loss and waste, uh, we don't seem to have a clear globally agreed upon definition of loss and waste. And so USDA has its own definition, FAO has its own definition, European Union has its own definitions, et cetera. And, and there's very little convergence across them. Now, why is this important? Um, it's important because different agencies collect data on food loss and waste based on their definitions. And once you have different definitions collect and um, data being collected relative to different definitions, then the ability to be able to compare across data sets, the ability to be able to merge data sets across countries, across geographic regions, et cetera, becomes very, very difficult. And, and one finds that even when you look at the sustainable development goals, um, the target 12.3, which is on reducing food loss and waste, um, around this target, there's been indices that have been developed around uh, food waste and, and food loss. But if you look at the, the metrics around them, 
the metrics don't particularly uh, converge to any of the existing definitions around food loss and waste. So that's been a big challenge. How do you get to a global understanding when you don't have a globally agreed upon definition and metrics to measure this um, food loss and waste? The other interesting and I think important issue that came out of this review was that uh, about the paucity of data sets uh, that you can actually use to come up with any global indicator or global measure of loss and waste. Uh, it turns out that in the FAO database on food loss and waste, 65% of the data comes from um, the African post-harvest loss information systems work. And, and that accounts for uh, more than two thirds of all the data we have for developing countries. And another six to eight percent comes from the Indian ICAR database. So there's very little data across developing countries which actually documents food loss and waste. Clearly, that will allow us to come to some globally generalizable uh, conclusions. Next, please. So that that was sort of the. The, the reasons why we decided that we wanted to, uh, to put together a volume that addresses food loss and waste at, uh, for developing countries, low and middle income countries, and look at this subject in, in greater detail. Much of the existing broad literature in this, uh, in this area is very much focused on work that's happened in the US, work that's happened in Europe, et cetera. And so we felt a developing country perspective was really important to bring in. And it's important at this moment in time because food loss and waste is now a big part of the global discussion, global debates, not just in terms of food security terms, which is really important, but also in terms of environmental issues, climate change impacts, so the food loss and waste. And, and so it's become a central part of the overall discussion on food systems. And therefore we felt it's timely to put together a comprehensive volume in this area. We also felt that much of the discussion seems to take uh, an, an approach of thinking about loss and waste independent of where countries are in their overall economic development, in their overall structural transformation process. And, and we felt it's important to tie food loss and waste to food systems transformation and how food systems transformations are being driven by broader economic changes that are taking place in the economy. And, and by doing that, one can identify where along this value chain uh, you see the loss highest at, for countries at different stages of economic development. So that's how we thought about the book and, and we're looking at how one can synthesize the existing literature, existing, which is much, a large part of it is case studies, et cetera, and, and use a food systems lens and the value chain approach to synthesizing this literature and identifying specific uh, interventions and investments along the value chain that can help reduce uh, the food loss and waste in different countries. And, and, and very much focused on trying to come up with a, a common um, globally acceptable methodology and, and the framework that one can build uh, the discussion of food loss and waste in low and middle income countries. Next, please. Jocelyn, next slide. Yeah, thanks. Um, so the book is in three parts. The first part brings together the broader definitions and methodologies used in this literature and tries to argue for a common framework the second part of the book very closely ties 
food loss and waste discussions to food security discussions and, and discusses the implications of food loss and waste interventions relative to uh, our common understanding of different metrics around food security. And then the third part uh, looks at policy interventions, investment interventions, et cetera, along uh, the different parts of the, the uh, food value chain and looking at different levels of structural transformation uh, for uh, that countries are in. And the, the big message that comes out is that one needs to be very careful about identifying policies and interventions um, and, and be very specific about their relevance to a country at a particular stage of development, rather than come up with broad, generalized recommendations that are given for the entire developing world. With that, I'm going to stop here and hand over to Jocelyn to go through in more detail. Great, thanks Prabhu. Um, so yeah, now I will walk through each part to give a sense of um, what each uh, portion of the book will cover. Um, and we'll start with um, the first part. So this is really to orient readers um, to the food loss and waste definitions and estimation frameworks. Um, so as Prabhu mentioned, we first looked at you know, what data exists um, using the food at the FAO food loss and waste database. And um, so the large rectangle represents over 21,000 data points from 2004 to 2021. And we can see that there are different um, source availability uh, of the data and um, each rectangle, each individual rectangle represents an individual source of data. Um, again, as Prabhu mentioned, the African post-harvest loss information system represented nearly 65% um, of the data or it contributed that much data um, to this data set, um, followed by FAO sources at about 14%. And the FAO, FAO sources is from a variety of different um, contexts and may or may not use the same um, definition or measurement um, methodology. And so we took this and we first looked at, okay, what definitions are, um, are these different data sources using? So we compared them using um, a food loss and waste definitional um, framework uh, that identifies different um, elements to a definition. And we started out with a definition put forth by the FAO um, Global Initiative uh, for Food Loss and Waste Reduction in 2014. And the aim of this definition was to be, um, was to harmonize and uh, make globally applicable definition of food loss and waste. Um, so when we compare that to these major contributors of um, food loss and waste data, so coming from Africa, the US and India, um, we see that generally there is alignment um, specifically with regard to the scope covered. So food supply chains that are intended for human consumption, um, also the stages that are covered within this definition um, and the criterion. So any food that goes for a non-food use is considered food loss and waste and also it considers only um, the edible portion. And when we consider um, the SDG 12.3 indicators, so the food loss index and food waste index, um, collectively, these really don't align with that um, har more harmonized definition um, or more globally applicable definition um, put forth in uh, 2014. So for our um, book, we use this um, 20, FAO 2014 definition, we summarize it as food loss and waste is a reduction in the quantity or quality of the edible portion of food intended for human consumption. When food is redirected to non-food uses or when there is a decrease in the nutritional value, food safety or other quality aspect from the time food is ready for harvest or slaughter to consumption. Um, so in using this definition throughout the book, we have, we maintain consistency of what exactly we're talking about and how we conceptualize food, food loss and waste. Um, and we break down uh, for clarity, uh, the difference between the quantitative loss. Um, so we refer to this as physical food loss and waste that's usually measured in terms of mass or volume. Um, and we differentiate that from the food quality loss. Um, so this is the loss of nutrition, food safety or another quality aspect. Um, in this chapter, we also look at definitions of food quality attributes because there are quite a number of them. 
um, if not infinite. And so we present um, two different uh, frameworks. First is the search experience and credence attribute framework that categorizes different quality attributes in terms of um, the observability. So can is the attribute easily observed before it's consumed at the time of consumption, or is it not easily observed either before or during um, consumption? And we also identify attributes that are intrinsic or extrinsic. So are, can the attribute change over time? Can it be lost over time? Um, or is the attribute a static attribute that doesn't change? Um, and so it can't necessarily be lost, but it may be um, important in food loss and waste pathways um, that are related to physical food loss and waste. We next look at um, different uh, measurement methodologies using the methods framework on the left. Um, so the current issue is that most of the food loss and waste data estimate physical food loss and waste, um, but it's done unreliably due to lack of standardized methods and reliance on ind indirect measurement and secondary data. So a lot of the time, um, or the primary goals generally for measuring food loss and waste are based in food security, environmental sustainability, um, and economic perspectives. And there are significant data gaps by food product. Um, so there's a lot of gaps, for example, for perishable foods, um, also gaps in which value chain stages are included, particularly with the midstream, um, midstream stages and geography. Um, so a lot of the food loss and waste data come from high income countries and our book is really focused, um, you know, we draw upon evidence from high income countries, but really focusing on low and middle income countries. And so we review um, physical food loss and waste estimation approaches um, that are, and we summarize the strengths and limitations of different methods within operational context. So we draw upon the methods that are used for, um, that we identified in the FAO food loss and waste data set um, to understand what are actually being um, used in the field right now. Um, and then we more broadly look at uh, different measurement methods. So for physical food loss and waste, this is primary data collection and also using secondary data. Um, and we also, we also look at um, different issues with reporting and reporting standards. For food quality loss, we draw upon the literature in um, looking at food quality loss in um, the food loss and waste literature to understand what sorts of composite indicators are used and how they're used. Um, so these include grades and categories, price and date labels. Um, and then we also look at individual quality attributes um, for a select num um, number of quality attributes that kind of pop up in the literature most of the time. In the second part, um, here we focus on the food loss and waste pathways that are linked to food security. And so we start out with those that are linked with safe and nutritious foods. Um, so again, drawing upon our food loss and waste definition, we're focused on harvest, the time from harvest to consumption. And in this chapter, we're thinking, okay, what are, when there's food quality loss, but food, but physical food loss and waste does not occur, that means that um, consumers may be consuming a food that has degraded over time um, and may become unsafe or less nutritious. At the same time, um, we know that there are some causes of loss that do occur at the agricultural production side. Um, so we do consider those particularly uh, when we're thinking about food safety issues and then um, where along the value chain, the um, food quality loss actually occurs. So for food safety loss, we're looking at the biological, chemical, and physical hazards. Um, and these um, can change depending on the food system types. So as food systems modernize from traditional to modern systems, um, the scale of the food uh, foreign disease burden shifts from, um, from minimal to major. Uh, and so we're looking at, you know, what are the foodborne hazards, uh, the sources uh, within different food system contexts, and because food safety issues tend to be credence attributes, so these are not easily observed either before or at the time of consumption, we are also looking at the literature to see, okay, what are, um, what are the correlations between food safety hazards and other food quality loss attributes that are search attributes that can be observed before um, consumption. We also look at nutrient loss pathways as another type of food quality loss. Um, and so this involves nutrient degradation and leaching. Um, these, this typically occurs at sort of like the midstream stages of the value chain. So um, 
considering things like the storage timing and storage environment, as well as the extent and type of processing and type of packaging. And so we pull this all together um, at the end of the chapter to also look at um, potential food safety and nutrient loss trade-offs. Um, this mostly focuses on um, when food safety is prioritized and for example, if there's certain processing to maintain the food safety of food um, and nutrients are lost, it, there is this trade-off, but generally speaking, um, food safety is more of an immediate uh, impact for um, food security. In the next chapter in this um, section, we look at food loss and waste linked to food availability. And so here we're focused on the pre-harvest and harvest stages and determining what, um, what food is uh, entering the, the value chain. And so this focuses on quality in two ways. First, we look at the factors that contribute to the different quality attributes of foods that are destined both for fresh and processed markets. So this starts off with um, fresh foods. What are the physiological processes um, that are related to the natural development of foods, particularly with regard to perishable, um, perishable foods? And then we look at, okay, well, what are the changes in quality attributes when fresh foods are processed? So for example, if um, fresh fruits or vegetables are dried, those um, quality attributes, both desirable and undesirable, may shift, are likely to shift. Um, we look at the mechanical, chemical, and environmental sources of food quality loss um, for both fresh and processed foods, and try to identify what are the types of risks, um, or what are the risks of uh, food loss waste post-harvest that actually become barriers to production and um, what producers are deciding what types of products to grow, for example, if they're trying to avoid certain perishable foods um, because of, of the risk of post-harvest losses. The second um, piece to this chapter is looking at um, the harvest timing. And so we're relating the desirability, um, desirable quality attributes and um, decisions to as to when to harvest. So when we're talking about the pre-harvest and harvest stages, um, the pre-harvest period in the context of the food loss and waste um, is really focused on when the product is ready for harvest, but hasn't yet been harvested. So it doesn't include necessarily the entire production side, um, but this narrow window of time. And so we want to understand um, how does the availability and accessibility of technologies, knowledge, and infrastructure um, impact this harvest timing? And what are the different assessment um, methods that producers are using to assess food quality? And what are the acceptable quality tolerance limits um, that they use to determine the timing of harvest? And the last piece to this is really understanding the capacity um, that producers have to manage issues of seasonality. And this is particularly true in the case of perishable products um, that really their fresh value chains operate may operate in uh, quite a short amount of time. So lastly, um, we look at food loss and waste pathways that are linked to accessibility and affordability. Um, so these focus on the post-harvest stages. So what food is actually moving along the value chain and what reaches consumers. And there are several different types of pathways involved here. Um, so we can see that there may be food quality loss along the um, value chain up into a point where then uh, food is diverted away and it becomes a physical food loss and waste. So this occurs throughout the transportation, storage, processing, distribution stages. Um, there can also be other pathways where physical food loss and waste comes first. So a particular part of um, a food product is removed and um, the final product, there's been food quality loss of the final product. And this um, typically happens during processing um, or storage. And an example would be like refining of grains um, and removal of certain um, parts that are higher in, um, in micronutrients. And lastly, we um, want to understand what are the different feedback loops um, between these different food loss and waste pathways as it relates to accessibility and affordability of food um, and the potential for food loss and waste reduction to contribute to stru structural transformation. Um, so this would be a particular focus too on how, um, for example, the um, there could be, um, excuse me, <laughs> for example, um, if 
there's rise in op opportunities for non-farm rural employment um, and also increases in income and how those feedback loops um, contribute to the affordability of food. The second part of this chapter focuses on the food quality laws um, with or without changes in acceptable quality limits uh, in the specific food environments and how this might contribute to physical food loss and waste of so food being removed from the value chain and lowering the supply. Um, so we know that there are different structures of markets and the location of markets serve different consumers. And we want to understand you know, what are the strategies um, that are used to avoid actually physical food and loss and waste that might actually influence um, the types of food commodities that are accessible in certain markets. And lastly, we look at the role of trade um, in determining quality standards, both for export and um, domestic standards, as well as compliance issues and redirection of food. Um, so we want to understand what are the foods that um, frequently do not meet standards um, and also when foods are redirected, which foods are they? Um, where are they redirected to? Is it to a different um, food value chain or is it to a non-food use? Um, and what are the causes of food quality loss or um, physical food loss in those? And so um, the final part of this book looks at the approaches to prevent and manage food loss and waste. And we start out to understand what the investment priorities and leverage points are. Um, so we consider the prioritized investment across different food system types, and we summarize the evidence on critical points where food loss and waste occurs along um, which food loss and waste pathways. So here we're considering what are the different food commodities and food system types and the different value chain actors involved. And we use this to examine the causes of food loss and waste and the potential entry points for interventions. So we're keeping in mind that um, these pathways aren't necessarily linear and the location of food loss and waste may be different than, um, than the cause of the loss, um, both in terms of the quality loss and um, physical food loss and waste. And we also integrate the discussion of feedback loops and trade-offs um, into understanding the causes of loss. And so the aim of this chapter is to really identify the alignment of leverage points with investment priorities for each food system type. Next, we look at interventions. Um, so we consider technology governance and practice, and we use um, the uh, framework on the right to look at the different aspects of food loss and waste reducing interventions to examine interventions by the level, the type, and the actors involved. And so here we consider um, the food systems and their defining features uh, to see you know, which interventions are facilitated by um, higher level actions, and the types of interventions that may be available and accessible um, are different depending on the given stage of structural transformation. And again, considering what the um, operating context looks like. And lastly, we consider what the changes in the roles and influence of actors are depending on these defining features of the food system. And so here we're identifying the facilitators and barriers to implementing different sets of strategies across food systems and um, examining areas of synergy across the different food loss and waste pathways. So these pathways aren't just um, operating in, in their own way. Um, there is certainly a lot of integration um, between how food loss and waste occurs. In the second to last chapter, we wanted to um, focus on opportunities and challenges for inclusion. And so here we're really focusing on gender and um, informal markets. So, Food loss and waste estimation methods may inadvertently exclude women's participation and contribution, both at the, on the farm and off the farm, um, because of, again, thinking about certain contexts and um, some the, the way that the measurement methods are designed may um, accidentally um, or inadvertently exclude um, certain stages. So we consider, consider gender-based constraints that influence the division of labor and access to knowledge, services, technologies, and other resources. So we plan to draw upon um, this uh, gender-sensitive value chain mapping approach um, from the FAO and looking at these critical loss points along the value chain to identify you know, where um, do women participate um, both in terms of which stage and maybe the location of where that, that stage occurs and where the loss might occur. Um, additionally, we 
know that informal markets can be overlooked um, when it comes to food loss and waste reduction strategies. So together, we're trying to identify potential gaps that are related to gender constraints and informal markets um, in both the food loss and waste measurement methods and the reduction strategies. And um, our last chapter kind of brings everything together. Um, and so looking at the policy agenda and way forward, um, we do this using um, two broad approaches to address food loss and waste. So first order and second order approaches, first order being interventions that specifically target food loss and waste. So here we're looking at, you know, how the policies either align with the um, investment priorities or not. Um, what are the challenges to implementation, again, in, in different contexts and um, food system types? And what are the potential cascading effects along the value chain? And again, the value chain may depend on the different food commodity, the different food system, um, and what are the impacts, if any, on food security? When we look at the second order policies, so these are um, interventions that um, for sustainable food supply chains that uh, improve food security and nutrition. Um, so what are the underlying causes of food loss and waste that are linked to these broader policies? Um, and what might be the gaps in knowledge and policy coherence that um, limit, you know, how we can assess the different trade-offs between these uh, more broad policies and reducing food loss and waste? And lastly, are there any unintended consequences to the food loss and waste pathways um, and or food security? And so the overarching goal here is to integrate kind of all the different chapters in the book to identify promising and inclusive um, policy agendas that align with food loss and waste prevention with food security um, investment priorities. And so with that, um, I'll close out and uh, we can open it up, I guess, to Q&A. Thank you to our speakers uh, for the excellent presentation and, and outlining what the book covers uh, in terms of the definition of food loss and waste, it's uh, linkages to uh, food as well as nutri uh, nutrition security, its impact and the need for contextual and 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 like like Dr. Pingali said, relevant solutions uh, related to preventing and managing food loss and waste. Uh, with that, I will now open the forum for discussion. We already have a few questions in. Uh, once again, please share your questions in the Q and A box, and we'll try our best to get to as many questions as we can, time permitted. Uh, so for our speakers, I'll start with the first question uh, regarding the definition, and, and, and uh, this is a question from Ahmed Kaplan as to for food loss, where does it start and where does it end in terms of the definition of your analysis? Uh, in other words, where do you start considering food loss versus food waste? And Jocelyn or, or Dr. Bengali. Sure, I can, I'm happy to take that on. So um, the we when we use the framework so the framework we're using in this book is to use collectively terminology food loss and waste together and not differentiating um, food loss versus food waste and the reason for that is there have been several different approaches in the literature to say when what is food loss specifically what is food waste specifically um, most commonly um, it's based on a stage in the value chain where loss occurs so we avoid that because um, for two reasons. One, the where loss occurs may not be um, where the cause of loss occurs. Um, so the cause may be earlier in the um, value chain or at different parts. Um, so if food loss occurs you not know, the consumer side or food loss and waste occurs at the consumer side, the cause might have been um, several stages before or across different stages. Um, and the second reason is really, you know, in terms of terminology, we want to be as simplistic as possible to avoid these confusions and um, be able to harmonize one definition. And so part of the definitional framework is to identify what stages are covered. So if we're already talking about a specific stage, um, we don't necessarily need to use a different term. We can call it food loss and waste at whichever value chain stage. So it helps with the um, just clarifying, um, you know, what exactly we're talking about is what we found in sort of our, pro our approach with the book. Right. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Jocelyn. So there are a couple of questions on whether the book uh, considers seasonality and climate change. And, and uh, this, this is a question from Nidhi Ralhan. Uh, 
asking if you are looking into climate linkages uh, with, with food loss and waste. Sure. Um, so we, so the initial, our, our main focus is um, food loss and waste and its linkages to food security. Of course, the elephant in the room is um, climate change and, um, you know, what are the environmental impacts? Um, that could be a whole volume in and of itself. Um, so I think we're still trying to work on how to integrate that um, into this book without, again, just transforming it to a totally different focus. Um, but we are incorporating issues of seasonality because that is a huge um, issue with food loss and waste, especially with the more perishable products. Um, so certainly that is um, already in play. Um, but yeah, I don't know probably if you want to uh -huh, say anything. Sure, I'll just add a change. couple of points to that. Um, on the climate change issues, you know, there are two sides to that. One is the impact of climate change on food loss and waste. And the other is food loss and waste impact on climate change. And so um, we, we, as Jocelyn said, we are, we are not doing a full climate change assessment here. But I think as we think about losses along the value chain, so losses at the farm level, one can draw on the existing discussion on climate impacts on agriculture and draw inferences from that. For instance, another project that I'm working on in our, with our team here is on zero hunger, zero carbon. And there we're looking at carbon emissions from different food production systems and trying to say, how do you reduce that trade-off between hunger and carbon emissions? So one can draw on some of those lessons and say, under these circumstances, you may see uh, production losses or prevention of production losses or post-harvest losses, et cetera, and bring that into the discussion. But on the waste side, um, I don't think we have enough solid data from developing country food consumption patterns to be able to make any meaningful commentary on impact of food waste on climate, et cetera. But it's, uh, this topic has come up twice already, so. I think we'll take another look at how to address this. Great, thank you. And so uh, there's another question about uh, how food loss and food safety are inherently linked. And so the question is, food losses are associated with contaminants, uh, mostly in developing countries. Uh, and so should loss alleviation efforts address both natural and synthetic contaminants in, in food systems? I don't know if you want to share your thoughts on that. Um, so the way that we're, so yes, food, food safety is inherently linked. Um, it's part of food loss and waste. Um, and that's definitely a point that we are making in this book, um, especially with one of our chapters. So, um, the way that we're approaching the discussion with um, food safety, again, that is a, could be another volume in and of itself. Um, so we're really conceptualizing, you know, what that pathway may look like um, with regard to food quality loss. And if it's not identified and it does reach a consumer, um, that is a type of food loss and waste as food quality loss without any physical food loss and waste. Um, and you know, how if we're focusing only on quantitative losses, only on the physical food loss and waste, we may be missing that entire um, pathway. Um, at the same time, if we're reducing um, physical food loss and waste, um, is it just pushing it in, is it pushing it, the food into that food quality loss pathway? Um, for the, is it natural versus um, synthetic uh, food safety? So, um, this is where our definitional, our frameworks on what the food quality attributes helps because um, the way that we approach food quality loss um, is that there's an attribute and then it's lost along the way um, versus um, an extrinsic attribute where something may be applied, for example, like a synthetic um, 
that becomes a synthetic food safety issue um, and, and that's static. So it may or may not um, change. And so depending on how um, that food safety attribute can change or not change um, depends on whether it's classified as a food quality loss or a food, an issue of a food quality attribute um, that may or may not meet a certain quality threshold. So if we're talking about food safety, if there's a certain food safety threshold, it has to be identified firstly um, and then determined whether it meets that threshold or not. Um, yeah, so we're considering that and working through through um, through exactly that in, in the chapter. Oh, perfect. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so the next question is on the measurement. So measuring food loss and waste is quite complex, making it a barrier even for policy making and policy makers, development partners, and other actors uh, to take actions. Is there a way we can simplify the methodologies? Any thoughts on how this can be done? I think Jocelyn spent her whole PhD thesis worrying about this, so she can <laughs> tell you a lot. Yeah, I mean, from firsthand experience, it's um, it it's quite challenging, and um, I think the risk. I would say the risk of if anybody told me right now that they have a very simple method of measuring, I would be very skeptical. Um, but, and, and, and it speaks to the complexity of how value chains work. Um, you know, it's incredibly context dependent, not only in the geographic content text, but which value chain is it a fresher processed product? Um, is it, what is the exact quantity? There are so many different variables. Um, and I think the, I guess my response is more when we think about measurement, um, thinking about standards. So you can go and, uh, you know, how can whatever comes out of, of measurement, can it be compared to something else? Um, because we put all of this time and money into collecting data and uh, can that data actually be used um, is, is really kind of the key, key point there. And where, where do we want to invest um, our resources and how do we want to invest it to generate this much needed um, data on food loss and waste, um, even when we're just talking about the physical food loss and waste, um, when we're talking about the food quality loss, that's an even greater challenge um, in terms of measuring because there are so many different attributes and um, the complexity of, of those assessments are quite high. Great, thank you. And so, yes, complexity of, of the values and expense of data scarcity. So how do we go about that? How do we come up with quality and, and make sure that the data that we have are reliable? Um, I think there's two parts. So the, um, I guess first thinking about the food quality losses, um, you know, there, we draw a lot upon the food science literature um, because, you know, food scientists have been measuring food quality for a long time, um, but a lot of it is using lab methods. And you know, when you're out measuring food quality in the real world along these value chains, you're not bringing, you may not be bringing it um, into a lab or you know the time that it takes. And different value chain actors, they're using their own quality assessment methods as well. And so what, ex what happens in the lab versus in the real world is something to consider. Um, so that's why in our chapter, we look both at, you know, what are lab-based measurements, but also um, along a value chain, what are different value chain actors actually considering and how are they assessing um, food quality because that impacts their decision-making on um, possible uh, physical food loss and waste, what's removed from the value chain. Um, and I guess for the physical food loss and waste, um, yeah, I, I think, coming up with standards that can be ad adapted based on certain contexts. Um, and, you know, there have been a lot of efforts for that um, and a lot that have come out recently. And I think adopting those um, standards and, you know, tweaking them how, how they need to be. And it's, it's I think the field is, is still kind of figuring out its footing um, on that. Um, I would say kind of coming back to the issue that Prabhu mentioned at the beginning about um, the, how food loss and waste is actually defined, I mean, that feeds directly into these measurement methods. And so really, you know, the first thing is what are we even talking about when we talk about food loss and waste? And then once we can agree on that, then maybe we can kind of um, iron out some of the issues on the method side as well and have data that's of high quality and comparable. Mm -hmm. 
Excellent. So the next question is, what information is there on food loss and waste at the household level? Uh, thinking of, you know, for example, spool is after purchase. So, uh, so not, um, not a lot. Um, so I think a lot of the data at the, um, at the household level come from high income countries. Um, and even there, it's, it's difficult um, to capture. And, you know, if you think about it, the number of, you know, the number of actors along the value chain, once you get to consumers, it's, it's huge. Um, and so trying to capture that in different, um, different types of households with different um, consumption patterns, and um, that's difficult. And we don't have much data um, outside of, well, much data in general, and certainly um, not outside of high income countries. I think this is a really important issue because there's so much discussion on consumer waste and much of that debate is based on data that is in advanced countries, but is generalized across. So I think it's really crucial to figure out how one can get better data on consumption and consumer waste of food in developing countries. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'd also, I'll also just add, I think this is a good example too of conceptually where, you know, food loss and waste at the consumer side, um, you know, the causes may have been building as the product is moving along the value chain. So if you think of fresh produce, fresh fruits and vegetables that haven't been, um, you know, stored in an ideal environment or transported in an ideal environment, by the time they reach the consumer, maybe they're, you know, on the verge of quickly deteriorating and then the waste happens that it just happens while it's with them and it's documented as consumer waste but it wasn't because of layer neglect it's because of all these other issues that happened before they got the product right and so uh the next question is about uh uh private sector so uh you know Catherine is curious about if the book approaches any of the metrics uh, explained in the book from a private sector use case. For example, uh, tracking waste reduction to develop a business case for food loss and waste reduction investments. So I guess we, as of right now, we haven't um, explored too much in terms of specifically talking about the private sector and how measuring food loss and waste could. Um, could make the business case um, certainly something to to think about incorporating, especially as we kind of pull all the chapters together and look at um, the different policy agendas and how the public and private sector kind of need to work hand in hand um, in in different food system contexts. Um, I think you know, with regard to measurement in the private sector, I if if they are measuring food loss and waste, I think also considering um, sharing of data is important because you know we have this gap of data in the midstream value chain. So if there are processors, how how do they share their data, um, and do they want to share their data? How how does that work? Um, because again, when um, we're trying to access these public data sets and we see that it's most of it comes from the farm level, and then there is sort of a trickling of data um, along the rest of the value chain. Like, how can we also build that um, if we're trying to encourage the private sector to measure food loss and waste? Mm -hmm. So one thing about the private sector that I think we will be discussing quite a bit is on, on what kind of investments private sector needs to make uh, for reducing food loss and waste along the value chain. So things like um, uh, cold storage systems, temperature control transport systems, et cetera, along the value chain that allow you to reduce the loss, especially for perishable products. And then where the, what's the role of the public sector in broader infrastructure investments, roads, transport, electricity, communication, all of that, and how these two need to dovetail together to address this problem. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, right. So, one more question on uh, 
this is a question from, and I guess Jocelyn or uh, Dr. Pingali, you can just uh, weigh in on this. Can overconsumption be categorized as food loss and waste? Um, no. <laughs> People, I, th I don't think we want to demonize consumption behavior per se. Mm -hmm. We only want to say, you know, if it's not taken in, then what's happening to it? Mm -hmm. And so uh, one thing that did come in this morning's discussion on a separate meeting is also about you know, prioritizing food loss and waste as a development agenda and trying to understand how food loss and waste contributes to the food security and nutrition outcomes. So I don't know if uh, you have any thoughts on that or you know, any approaches that the book includes that might be helpful for the readers. Um. Yeah, this is something that came up also in the presentation that we made at USAID last week, where there was a question is, you know, if you're funding work on food loss and waste, are you sacrificing food security work? Are you taking funds away from food security work? And I, and I don't think it should be seen as an either or situation um, because one can look at a, a balance between the two objectives. And, and as Jocelyn presented, um, there are very significant food security implications from food loss and waste in terms of availability, access, affordability of nutritious food. So one can think about these as joint goals of addressing both food security and reducing loss. Uh, so we have three minutes, and I just want to give Jocelyn and, 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 and Prabhu uh, maybe like a 30 seconds to just give us your, your uh, concluding remarks and, and what, to, what to look for in the book. Go ahead, Jocelyn. Okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I guess really the, you know, again, the motivation and the approach we're taking in this book is to recognize that the approaches to address food loss and waste issues, um, they depend on a lot of different localized factors. So when we use this consistent conceptual framework um, to look at the problem, we can, this helps to us, us to understand, you know, what's the nature of the problem, um, and what can be done and how it, how is it related to food security in these different um, specific contexts. So hopefully that'll be informative to readers. Yeah, and, and I think um, one contribution that I hope will come out of this is to say, you know, what specific interventions at what points in the economic development process makes the most sense and make sense for different types of food. Uh, staple cereals versus perishable products, et cetera. And what kind of investments need to be made along the value chain. And, and finally, I think this book will highlight the fact that we know so little because we don't have the data. And that investment in better data systems is absolutely crucial if we want to make a difference in the long term. Right. Perfect way to end this webinar. And with that, we've, we've come to an end to this webinar. I uh, would like to thank Dr. Pingali and, and Boto for, uh, for their excellent presentations and wish all the luck that the book uh, can raise awareness and offer evidence-based recommendations and can contribute to shaping and advocating policies that drive positive change. Uh, thank you all. And uh, more information on, on getting access to the recordings of this webinar will follow. Uh, and thank you very much again to the to the speakers and everyone who joined today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.